to History After Hours podcast. Uh, this is episode nine. nine. It is November twenty fourth, two thousand fifteen. My name is Kevin Pumphrey, and to my right is I'm Mr. Pierce. Good morning, peasants. And to his right is Ron Franklin. Good morning. Yeah, and so you can uh, find us on Twitter at History After Hours PC. This will be uploaded to YouTube as well. You can just uh, YouTube search History After Hours. We have a channel there. And so we, this is number nine. And uh, yeah, how are y'all feeling this evening? Is everybody doing good? We're all getting ready to eat some Thanksgiving. Yeah, I'm going to bring up a Thanksgiving topic that we didn't get to a while ago. Well, have you ever heard people say that the tryptophan in yes. turkey is what makes you sleepy? Yes. It was a good, on a Seinfeld episode. What was it? I guess I'm not sure. The, the turkey has a natural, like, uh, oh, I thought chemical you were like in the country of turkey. I was like, what oh, is the no. country of turkey? Okay. Tur okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm the sorry. Turks are very sleepy people. <laughs> Terrorist group of turkey <laughs> called tryptophan. No, no, Thanksgiving, on Thanksgiving. On Thanksgiving. All right, so oh, no, okay. when okay. you eat a bunch of turkey and people goes, ah, and everybody passes out after the meal, right? That's kind of the way that works. Okay. And so there's always been, when I was a little kid, they're like, well, you know it's the tryptophan that makes you sleepy. And I'm like, tryptophan? What? I don't even know. I'm five. I don't know what that is. And so, um, so I've always kind of grown up thinking that was true-ish. Well, here's right? the thing. But, I, it's, I but, what I've, but it's not, no, though, it's apparently. Not. Dude, Appar I've for, I don't know about y'all, but when I eat just a lot, I always need to go take yeah, a nap. I think that's not just a turkey thing. I think it's just a thing. They said, and you, Pumphrey, you're a dietitian kind of guy, so um, uh, it's the carbs, right? Yeah, it's the sugar. I mean, anytime you sit down and eat 1,000 calories and the blood has to go down there for digestion and to absorb all these nutrients and sugar and all this stuff that you just put in, threw down your throat, uh, the blood is going to leave your brain and make you a little bit sleepy. So, um, yeah, eat light, people. Eat light. On the same topic of Thanksgiving, is Thanksgiving the forgotten holiday? Because you see a lot of people... What do you mean? I November 1st, Christmas flag, decorations, flag day is my music... Forgotten. Oh, you mean because we, we go right from uh, uh, Halloween, Halloween Christmas. Christmas. You know that uh, our Walmart had Christmas music playing Halloween night. Did they really? Yeah, like jingles were already in, in the present, and they had trees out and stuff. And I know you got to get ready for the next thing, but to your point, Thanksgiving, like where's Thanksgiving? Like, where's Why are there not Thanksgiving songs? Um, can you anybody name it? Is there a Thanksgiving song? Is it Luke? What? Hold on, what? Oh, yeah, 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 that, yeah, he said that Slave, I mean, where'd you hear that? Get the mic. Steve, go to him with the mic. Where did you hear that, that the song Sleigh Bells, or is it Jingle Bells or Sleigh uh, Bells? It's like um, the song that goes like dashing through the snow on a one horse. Just hear those sleigh bells, jing -a -ling, yeah. jing -a -ling, jing -ling, too. Yeah, I heard that Come on! <laughs> uh, we're going to go party time on you right now. Okay, no, go ahead, say it. Uh, I heard that on a, a radio station, so that's pretty much just where that, that's I can a, see that. Thanks. I'm getting some serious feedback that that's a Thanksgiving song. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. I never thought about it. Like, it was written specifically for Thanksgiving, and then yeah. Christmas like kidnapped it Christmas or something. Christmas osmosis like, adopted just, it, maybe. Yeah. Huh. Huh. I don't know. Maybe, okay, so dashing. there's one. Right. I'm sorry. Was that the sleigh bell song I sang, or the dashing through the snow? Jing no, you said dashing through the snow. Jingle yeah, bells. Horse open sleigh. Jingle open. bells is a Thanksgiving song, apparently. I don't know. I don't know. We have to verify that. That's weird. Wasn't there the, what's the Jingle Bell Rock? Thanksgiving, you know, you don't see too many Thanksgiving carolers. I mean, you know, I don't know. There's no reason. Everybody goes to sleep, so there's no reason to. I like Thanksgiving because it's, it's a good holiday where you have good food, you eat, and there's no presents involved. You don't have to worry about that headache. You're just hanging out and eating, which is always good for me. Because Christmas is stressful, especially when you got kiddos to buy for. And is Thanksgiving the longest meal that, you've, that you eat in a year? Because um, I'll eat for... Probably an hour. I eat like 12 times a day. <laughs> I'll, so. yeah. I'll just keep on, I'll get up so much momentum, I'll just slide into dinner. I won't even, you know, stop lunch Here's the new really. problem with Thanksgiving that I've found. You know, being, this being my first year being married, the whole issue of, okay, we have to go to two Thanksgivings now. You know, is it because, you know, I think there's always, there's going to be one family that You're can still going to go to your parents' house or yeah. they're going to go yeah. to her parents' house? We're going to both. Why, why don't you have one and make them come to you? And, uh, you Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> and he's divorced. I'm not, I'm not going to answer that question. You know what? I'm going to see. I'm going to stop. You know what? No, I set you up for that one. I just <laughs> you did. See, yeah. right. But there's always that one family that's going to cook better than the other family. And so. Oh, here we go. Do you eat more at one and snack at the next? or? So which family would you so Who do you visit first? Better? Yeah, I mean, are right. you, oh, you're not saying. you got to have some strategy to the, <laughs> like the planning out. And do, they, oh, and do they know that if you come to see them first that you think they're better cooks? 
Okay. I'm, <laughs> he's not going to say, he, don't back yourself into that corner. Yeah, I'm just going to. Okay, yeah. The way I always do it, we do a Thursday thing, normal, and then I do a Saturday one. Space it. Friday, you just kind of sit in your own gluttony. All right. Is there something that you have to have for it to be Thanksgiving other than turkey or ham? I mean, I'm talking about dressing. Meat. I'm not talking about meat. I'm talking about right? dressing. Oh, yeah, it's the only time, is it the only time of the year you eat dressing? No, we no we Christmas. Do we actually do like a half Thanksgiving in the summer. Well, here's what we here's we my all that stuff up. Little, dressing, little turkey. chicken and dressing. I don't even know what dressing is. Is my favorite egg bread meal. Thing. And so, like when I was in college, when I'd come home over the summer, I would I never moved back home when I was in college. Over the summer, like in July, my mom would make me dressing just because I came home. So, no. so yeah, I mean, you could have it as a special thing. Right. Yeah, but dressing is such a weird food. It's not. I mean, it's cornbread. Knows. It's liquid cornbread. What this is. is all. I hear this on the radio sometimes, where they go, "Do you do dressing or do you stuffing?" And in are those two different things. Yeah. Had, well, yeah, because if it? you stuff it in the bird, then it's right. stuffing. Well, if I it's thought not, if you pull it out, is it dressing by itself? No, it had been stuffed. No, I know, but if it's not in there, never mind. I think it depends. On We're going to go on for twenty minutes. How it was cooked. <laughs> about stuffing it's cooked versus the cavity of the bird carcass. I, I mentioned this uh, on the last podcast too, and we just want to make this PSA. That uh, no one take pictures of your plate during Thanksgiving because yes. we're all eating the same crap. Okay? Stop, stop be like, posting Look at my Thanksgiving meal. Yeah, just like mine. Just, just in general, general stop Turkey, posting pictures dressing. of food. Nobody well, really wants to see it. Put your phone up over Thanksgiving. Enjoy your time with your family. Or that. Yeah. Okay, Steve. Oh, okay. Oh, we have our first question. State your name. Anna Rose. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can I go ahead and ask now? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um... After the Oregon shooting recently, Obama had made a speech discussing the topic gun control. Why is he politicizing the gun issue when it's people's actions that we need to worry about? And what do you think about that? All right. So following the Oregon shootings and the gun debate shoot. rises up again about gun control. How, how, how many years have we been having the gun control debate since Kennedy was assassinated? Yeah, that was yesterday. By since the way. Lincoln that was assassinated? The anniversary of that yesterday. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, America is different on guns than, I guess, every other country because right. we've needed them when our country was founded. I mean, the size, the sheer scope of our country. A lot of countries, and I don't know if y'all have traveled very much, you know, hunting is a huge thing in our country. It's not that big in other countries. Not nearly as big. I mean, it's... Well, it was always restricted if you talk about it from a European standpoint. Like, right. not everybody, you weren't allowed to hunt, so it didn't become part of the tradition. Only the, you know, the aristocracy who had leisure time could go and do that. Yeah, so we have the big hunting background. We, we were on our own for a long, long time. You're, you're in the middle. I mean, some of these... I mean, Arkansas, when, when we Trappers. first became a state, you're out in the middle of nowhere. You needed it for protection against Indians and Native Americans and whatever else. So... You know, we have a love affair with guns unlike other countries. Now, this gun control thing has been politicized well, at least for 30 years now. Oh, my, li my lifetime, for sure. I mean, yeah. going on 40. It's been more. And, and we start, it's, you know, every time there's a shooting, then we try to figure out a problem, forward, yeah. uh, a way to solve the problem. And the how, how can you figure out all the crazy people that might do it? There's, that's a hard job. I mean, let's find all the insane people that could do it and just lock them up. Well, that's what we try to do. The only thing that we could control is how many guns are out there to some degree. But then, of course, you have the other topic of, well, if you take all the guns away from the good people, only the criminals will have it. Okay? So you've got so many levels, whether it's increasing background checks. You know what's weird is we have a no-fly list for terrorists. And most of them can go down and buy a gun, but they can't get on an airplane. <laughs> wow. It's weird. Uh, anyhow, That's you know, so background checks versus l the level of the gun, semi-automatic, you know, the guns that can do the most amount of damage in the shortest amount of time. But then you always have that guy, well, I could do so much damage with a shotgun, you know. I mean, do we let everybody have their own nuclear weapon? Is that a good idea? Let's pass out, you know. 30 meg megaton nukes to everybody. I mean, so there has to be a line somewhere. You can't neighbor. let everybody have every weapon they desire. All right, so do you, but you, the, it, when people talk about Second Amendment rights, and, and for the majority of our country's history, that the Supreme Court had never really ruled on that, but, but within the past couple of years, they've actually stated specifically that Americans have the right to own handguns, which was a, which was a different stipulation. So that, you know, from, from a federal uh, recognition standpoint, then we have... Uh, Credibility then behind the idea that, and that that gives people the, the. I think that it makes them 
less willing to say, well, you know, I might voluntarily give that up if, now that there's been an official ruling on that. So, but for, but for all the people that are afraid, well, the government's going to take our guns. Well, if the Supreme Court ruled on that, then no, that's not going to happen. There may be states that try to mandate different things, but that can be challenged in court because now that precedent has been set. So, but like you said, what, where do you draw that line? At, at what point do, at what caliber do you still, you know, is, is that something that needs to be addressed? What the size of the gun, the size of the actual uh, ballistics that can be restricted off to try to temper some of the things that are going on. And, and what I'm saying by that is this, do we need to militarize our civilian population? Is that necessary? Every some people gun, think it is. It was necessary 200 and however many years ago. You know, not, there's not that many people that are well trained to use a gun. Right. And it's easy to say, well, if everybody had a gun, well, no, that's not a good idea. I mean, that's, a, that's not a, to solve a problem and give everybody a gun. If you're not trained, you're more likely to kill someone, you know. I mean, even in our military, we die from friendly fire. All right. And they're jo trained. Jo let's jump into this because you've touched on something there, I think. And we go back into the Paris things, too. After the Paris attacks, I heard a couple of different people who said specifically, well, you know that if the Parisians all carried guns, then those attacks wouldn't have happened. And that baffled me because I know, and I actually brought up a little statistical chart on this because I was hoping we got to this today. A mass shooting in this country happens nearly every day. And, and the definition of mass shooting is that three or more people have to be injured or killed. And we are armed to the teeth as a nation, and yet that does not stop any of these mass shootings there's not there are a few instances and i will say this because i looked it up uh, washington post did a, a report on this they gave an example of probably 10 incidences in the last i forget what the time frame was let's say five to six years where some armed civilian actually stopped a, a terrorist type domestic terrorist uh, activity while it was going on but some of those were also off-duty police officers or off-duty uh, military folks who were trained to do what they do. And so to say that, that um, maybe even well-meaning people who have, the, who have a concealed carry permit to, to try to actually get involved and to stop someone who's doing something dastardly like that, that generally doesn't happen, number one. And number two, oftentimes when they do try to get involved, they end up getting themselves killed because they don't know what they're doing. They haven't been trained, like you said, properly to, to uh, handle a situation like that. So I, I really disagree with the idea that arming everybody makes everybody safer. And you know that, the, that Paris would have been safer if they all had guns. I can, I can bring up statistics like that. Matter of fact, let me show you. So we came prepared with I did. stats. No I, made, no, I, no, I did this last night. I got, this is from, uh, uh, I went through the FBI uh, statistical research. In this is just this year, this is just 2015. We've had 338 mass shootings in this country. Almost one a day. Right. 427 people killed. 1,229 people wounded. And those numbers don't overlap. And I've got. I actually broke it down by months to see what all was going on. And so, but you, we don't. We flip out, seemingly, over the attacks that happened in Paris, and it was a bad thing, don't get me wrong, but if you listen to our news, you would think that it was happening right here. But we don't get all upset about the fact that people are getting murdered in the streets of our cities every single day, and we just kind of go, meh, well, it's part of it. You know, so that can be part of the debate, too. Um, gun control, does it need to be debated more seriously? I think so. What are the answers? I don't have an answer. No. I mean, I, I, I support the Second Amendment, and I have a concealed carry permit myself, but I, but at the same time, I don't know that everybody owning guns makes us safer. But you and I don't go around shooting people all willy-nilly either, though, you know, because we're But who's crazy. to say, well, but you don't know who would do that. That's the point. Right. I have a question over here. Uh, I was just wondering uh, if, in the statistics, does it say where these shootings occurred? Generally, whether oh, yeah, large I've, yeah, I've got I've got the cities. I mean, I can break that down for you. I've got the website. I can show you. Um, it had just randomly across the country. And the, the the statistical thing that I was looking at, you can click the uh, the different columns, and it'll it'll sort it for you by city, by date. Um, I don't know if it's by how many people were injured or whatnot, but yeah, you can sort it out like that. So just uh, across the country, and it actually broke it down from, and, and it gave the reports like in the news 
like as they were being reported in the different cities. So some of them happened here, I mean, in Little Rock, as a matter of fact, there were a few of them on the list that I saw that were here, so. There's, there's the statistic of Chicago, I mean, I hear this a lot, there's the, tis, the statistic, excuse me, of Chicago being the, one of the most restricted cities of, of guns, you know, but they're the most, they're the high, they have the highest kill rate as well. Do you, could you see that being correlated at all? No, say that. Say it again. I missed you. They have the the highest gun restriction. Restriction, right? But at the same time, they have the highest kill rate because the, some people say the it's kind of the same thing with drugs. You know, drugs are illegal. People can get them anyway. You know, so so the thought being, um, if we take all the guns away from the or not take them away, that's not the but restrict them from all the good guys, will the bad guys still get them because they can? Do you <clears throat> if you See, I don't really have an answer for it, but I'm just saying that if you, do you give the police more authority to move more quickly than, than they can? Quickly in terms of response time? Response, I, like I said, I don't know, is it a matter of funding the police departments better so that they can do a better job of, of policing and getting to things? Well, I, think, I, I don't know. I think more of the issue in this specific instance is, does that hold some weight, the idea of restricting it? You know, I, I don't think this is necessarily a police. Do you thing. Th all right, no, let me flip it on you. Do you think okay. that that less restrictions in Chicago would equal less gun violence and less deaths in Chicago specifically? Well, you guess. No, you no, 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 I know. I know. In Chicago specifically, I don't think so. Well, maybe more importantly than tracking what guns are allowed and the restrictions of guns is studies being done to correlate these shootings, the people that are doing these shootings, and I know this has been done. Uh, what, what makes a person do one of these mass shootings? You know, very few people have the ability to kill another human being. I mean, this is studies that go out, people that are in the military in war will be at war on the battlefield and miss on purpose because they don't have it in them hmm. to kill another person. There's, there's studies that show a good percentage of our military will miss on purpose because they don't have it in them. But, but there's definitely something that's in you to do one of these mass shootings. Now, of course, socioeconomic, isolation, you know, it's the same thing that might, would make somebody commit suicide. Well, but to, statistically, though, these are people who aren't just doing random acts of violence. They're, I mean, targeting there are those too, but a lot of these are people who are targeting people that they know mm -hmm. or right. even related to. That's a, I think you know, that's a lot the, of the statistics of the school shootings, most of those people were the meek ones, the quiet ones, maybe been bullied. And they're doing this to lash out at the, what they see is, oh, this is where this happened at this school or, you know, that kind of stuff. So should the government spend more money in research uh, to figure out a link between someone that commits these murders, whether it's revenge killings or mass shootings or random acts of violence? Is there something we can do as a society? I mean, it increases government spending and all that, but it, would it be worthwhile if we could save thousands of lives down the line by identifying these people early and removing them from society or giving them the help they need to avoid these shootings? Is that more important than taking guns away? So what you're saying then is it, it's not about gun culture, it's just about culture in general? I think it's a combination of, of you know, I mean, they have access to these guns. That's part of it. I mean, we have these guns floating but, around. But, you, but part of what I'm saying is that you do see more violent crime in the larger cities, which is typical. You get an overpopulation, right. perhaps, and, and you have uh, poverty rates that are higher, and you have people that are doing sort of desperate things, and maybe they don't have control over their own emotions because they haven't been, you know, may, maybe they don't exist in, a, in an environment which allows them to sort of explore that softer side of their personality. And then so their reaction is to just to blast people away because that just seems like the way it needs to be done. I mean, I, I, that's part of it. I think that has to be studied too, though. I think, I yeah. think you're right. In response to what you said, I think we do need to, do, whether it's because of gun control or whatever the factor may be, I think we do need, we have an obligation to do a better job of reaching those people who may have the, whatever the problem is. I do think, yes, we do need to explore that more just in yes. response to what you were, were saying but just to randomly take people's guns i just don't think right. number one i don't think that's going to happen uh especially considering what i started with was the supreme court decision yeah. saying no it, it's you do have the right to arm yourself and defend your this is one of my more conservative issues my ideas. yeah i'm pretty conservative on this yeah, too i do well. think the interpretation of the second amendment has changed do, in the yeah, last few years right, right. where it's it's the right to own individual to own a gun 
as you know, it used to be the right to for a state to raise a militia right. mm-hmm. that is armed. Well, Steve, but, the, but they've clarified it to say individual people with individual, like like I said, handguns specifically. Right. So, go ahead, uh, Steve. Steve Lowry, I was just wondering what your take on the fact that the majority of these school shooters, and whenever I say majority, um, the very high percentage of these school shooters are white males. I don't have a statistic on it, but I can find one. Uh, that's a that's a complicated question, Steve. What, so I, what's the question, I guess? What are you wanting us to interpret it, you know, of the, that idea? Why is it that it's white males that okay. are lashing out specifically? Well, I don't know if why that is. I mean, these are people that stay in their rooms for hours and hours and they're lonely. I mean, people are social people. You want to drive somebody insane, put them in solitary confinement. And some people feel like they're in solitary confinement even when they're surrounded by people. They generally have no friends. They have no, they're not involved in anything. They're not, they don't have any activity that empowers them. Some of you guys play football or you, whatever you do, paint your nails, that gives you whatever. You have something in your life that, that you look forward to. You have something in your life that, that drives you, something, that probably, something positive, whether it's church, whether, whatever it is. And these people that commit these crimes don't have any of that. They are in their own solitary confinement. I wonder statistically, are they also, since you brought up the white male, are they also from fairly affluent families? Is that part of the statistic? Do you know? That would be interesting to see. I mean, I wonder what their socioeconomic status is for the majority of those people that have committed these crimes. I don't know. I'm just asking. It's been shown that a lot of these people who do commit those sat inside their rooms for hours at a time playing these, you know, first-person shooter games on, you know, on their. Yeah, well, well, with some of these. Okay, but but no, I'll, I'm gonna jump on that right away because maybe there's a little bit of a link to that depending on. I wasn't how, saying there was a link. No, 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 to no. It. But let me let me finish what I'm saying. If if you go to a country like Japan, for example, they have much more violence in their media and in their. Uh, in their game systems and even in, in let's say artwork, but it, but as a culture, they are maybe the nicest people on the planet. They're very you know, cordial and respectful and all this. So I don't know that you can show a direct link between media saturation and that type of behavior. I think well, that I it goes. Be, I think, that, but I think that in a culture that already disrespects itself, and then you place that kind of stuff on top of that. Well, that's you what know, I was suggesting. then it becomes, then it can be a, a factor. Uh, I, but I go back to, to general culture. No, that's, that's uh, what I was suggesting. Yeah. You add all those factors together. And sometimes right. it's, a, it's a couple people that commit these things together. So I don't know where loneliness ties into that when it's two or three people that, that storm into a, oh, well, Columbine, there was a yeah, couple was what, guys that shot everybody. You know, they were, yeah. yeah. So you, do, you never know, I mean, what motivates somebody to do something like that. That's what I was saying a while ago with the research and the psychological studies to try to figure that out. Steve? Um, just, I looked on the FBI website, and in just six instances in the school shooting events, there were 479 throughout, no, that's 160 active shooters from the year 2000 to 2013, and just six of those 160, the shooter was female. I'd just thrown that in there. You asked Shoot. about the um, oh, female, actual yeah. um, sex of the person, then also their socioeconomic status. Yeah. Well, I, like I said, I, I I don't think you can pinpoint one thing that would cause that, or maybe even show that that demographic. Uh, you know, why why do they seem to be the ones standing out for that? I don't. There know. there are definite people. There's groups that do these studies, the experts in the field that are trying to make these links. The question is identifying these people. And most of them go to the school where they ha- where this happens. You do know? they do they have strained uh, relations with their families, their direct I mean their immediate families? I wonder if that's a if that's part of it too. I don't know. <coughs> okay. Anybody else Anything have a else? question? Something dark and disturbing? <laughs> Recently, the uh, uh, I'm Luke Long. Uh, recently, the FDA approved uh, genetically modified salmon to be sold in stores, and uh, they've not required them to be marked as genetically modified organisms. And this is the first time that they've allowed that to happen. Um, what are your thoughts on the moral ethics of like modifying an organism and patenting it? And also, um, what do you think about the requirements about it, like the 
the the way that it should be um, regulated. Other than the fact that they genetically fixed it, I, you know, I don't really know the specifics about this, but other than the fact that they fixed it or whatever, is there anything different, the end product of the natural and the they, modified? They fixed it? Well, I don't know the word. What you well, mean? you Actually, go, I don't know what's wrong with this. natural salmon. I Look, America what they, is what's the purpose? one of our big problems. One of our huge problems is our food supply. We have probably the most unhealthy food on the planet. You look at an American chicken, and it looks like it's been lifting weights its entire life. You go to Europe, and they have tiny little chickens, normal. I think, probably rightly so, that when you start genetically modifying, when you start injecting with hormones, I don't think that's healthy. I probably think that that's not healthy. Uh, now, I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm not a nutritionist to any degree. There's a host of things that are not uh, approved by the FDA. Walk into GNC and buy your whey protein powder, and it says it's got this in it. Who knows what it's got in? You know, when you're buying supplements, there's a lot of things that, are, that the FDA does not approve, yet they get sold to the public. I don't know where the line is, but I think for as far as food, regular food, chicken, eggs, milk, all that stuff, what it says on the label, our government should make sure that that's what's in it. So people at least have the knowledge that, hey, I'm buying this, and I'm, I, you can buy whatever you want. But they also need to understand that there's certain things that are not regulated by the FDA. And, and if you want to partake in that, then that's, a, that's your personal freedom to do so. But I think our food supply... What's the group that basically has a monopoly on our food supply? Monsanto. Yeah. I mean, I just think that they have so much power, there's no telling what you're eating. <laughs> you know, it's just a sad, unless you grow it yourself, uh, you know, it's just hard. And, you know, generations, like, how many of your grandparents know how to can food? Anybody? Mm. Can food? Yep. Y'all even know what? The, see, my grandparents. I was. I remember going to my grandmother's house and eating green beans from 1977 because they've been. She grew them herself and she freezes them in a freezer mm. and she canned fruit. My parents did that a little, but then and I don't do it at all. We rely on other people to provide our food. Right. And you know, you I never know, know if, what's. what's I don't in know it. if any of these y'all kids have done this before, but I know for me, I'm sure y'all do this too. One of the most tedious tasks ever is shelling purple hull peas with yeah. your grandmother oh, yeah. and, the, and yeah. getting the purple yeah. all I over I spent my hand. childhood with purple thumbs yes. because we I had to go I don't know if any of y'all have ever done that, but that's, that's My grandparents had a garden. We had to go help, yeah. I don't, think, right. I don't know if this generation is, has, is ever going to grow any crops. I don't know it, that they're ever going to... show of hands. Is, how many of you have actually... Do you have a garden? Like, either worked in a garden or have people who, who actually raise a lot of food for themselves and then can it and store it? That's, that's pretty More good. than I thought. That's, all, that's yeah. quite Anybody a make their own clothes? Y'all know how to sew? All right, let me jump back on what Luke said. I've got two other points to, to throw in on this. This isn't my area of expertise here, so I'm not sure how. When the health concerns are one thing, okay, and, and, and time will tell exactly what that's going to do to us. It'll take probably 20 years' worth of research on top of, of what we're doing, so the immediate effects aren't going to be known. It'll be down the road we figure out if this is actually a bad plan or not. So that's something that still remains to be seen. But if you look at this from a business standpoint and then a consumer standpoint, those two places, if I am in the business of providing food for the American public, yet I'm also beholden as an independent company to make as much money as I possibly can because that's why I'm in business, then it behooves me to try to figure out ways to increase production. Whether I'm talking about a factory or I'm talking about a farm, increasing production is a big thing for me. And if I have so many chickens or I have so many cattle, then I need to have them as lean as they can be and as big as they can be because then I have more volume of product that I can then sell. So being able to inject them with hormones or inject them with other things that will make them larger or to genetically alter them so that they'll be larger just on their own, then that's going to improve my profit margin and that's going to make me a more successful company. I can hire more people and then we can have talking about the whole captains of industry sort of scenario and that brings the entire pro, uh, production level up. We all benefit from the fact that they're doing well. That's an argument. From a consumer standpoint, you don't want to have to go to the grocery store and spend a thousand dollars every time you come out of Kroger. Part of the increased production also keeps costs low, right? And, and food prices have, have been raised recently because we've got inflationary things going on, but realistically, 
if they, especially at this point, if they stop doing some of these things, if the government came through and said, you can no longer put these things, or you can no longer modify, and you can no longer, because we do this with fruits and vegetables, and we do this with the, with the animals too. The chickens won't lay as many eggs. The cows won't produce as much milk. There won't be as much beef on the market. There won't be as much chicken on the market. And therefore, the limited supply is going to cause the price of those things to skyrocket. It's just supply and demand. That's the way it works. So... You have to look at it from that standpoint, too. How much more can the American public stand as far as inflation goes? If we regulate these companies extremely, we're going to decrease their profit margin, and then, they're going to, uh, and then you're going to have less uh, product and a higher cost when you go. So that will restrict what people can do, and which affects their quality of life overall. So, uh, and then you throw the health benefits or the concerns on top of that, and then so we've got a real mixture of things. I do agree with what you're saying and to, 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 that the government should do a better job of forcing these people to actually notate when something has been genetically modified or has been injected with whatever. But I tell you that the more they do that, the people will be sort of scared off, perhaps, because they don't know what's like, you know, this Frankenstein food scenario, perhaps. We don't know what's going to do to us, which can also cause a backlash, right? So I don't know. I, I think that's and a that, complicated thing. Of course, that thing. increases government spending. The more you And the more you regulate, you the know. higher the prices are going to be, too. So there's a balancing act here. Do we, as a nation, we consume tremendous amounts of food, but we also are very wasteful. We throw a lot of stuff away. Like, we don't... Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, there, there's actually a, a couple of colleges who do classes called garbageology, where they actually study our wasteful habits and to see what people actually throw out into the trash and, the, and end up in the landfill. So, um, or in the ocean. Or in, in the ocean, right. So I don't know. The, on one hand, I think consumers, from a consumer standpoint, I think that I want to be more well-informed so that I can do a better job of trying to feed my family. Uh, but then also you have to look at it from a larger, you know, a sort of a macroeconomic standpoint too. Do we want higher costs for business and for uh, and, and I could jump into my whole population thing, but I'm not going to. It's been thoroughly also, covered. I could, I could throw in my uh, the, the floating landfill that's as big as Texas, but I'm going to ignore that as well. My natural instincts to go off on all that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, hey, here's a little uh, tidbit of knowledge. Did you know when you buy a diet drink and it says zero calories, that's not true? The only thing that, you know, a company gets permission to put zero calories if it's less than four. So I'm just going to throw that out there. So, yeah, see? So dot, when you drink that Dot Mountain Dew thinking, hey, no calories, it's actually three or four calories. The only thing zero calorie is water. Um, okay. Uh, wait, oh, well, let's go on uh, talk about just additives to, the, to foods that are, that are out there. If you eat anything that has um, a label with more than three ingredients, you're pr it's probably not very healthy for you. Yeah, eat simple, people. Eat simple. The more stuff you add... And of course, we could go into I could I could talk about nutrition, and, you know, and I'm doing it from a physical fitness thing because I did that for a long time. But um, but but I won't because <laughs> we don't have the time. We actually have to shut this down. It's already been 30 minutes. Has it really? I believe so. Wow. Um, we do want to thank you guys for uh, coming out. You know, I, I know that it was a lot to buy tickets to this event, and we appreciate you doing that. It's going to go to a good cause. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm kidding. It's, we're forcing them to do this. Look at them. They're bored to tears. Or signs on our doors. Um, Come to the auditorium. <laughs> do it. But this is better than sitting in class. And, uh, of course, I know you're excited about Thanksgiving, which you're about to all go partake in and gain 20 pounds. Okay. So, beware of the tryptophan. Yeah, beware of the tryptophan. Loosen the belt. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. Do some push-ups. All right. Uh, so this has been episode nine of the podcast. Excellent. You can find us on History After Hours PC on Twitter, on YouTube as well. And uh, that's it. Goodbye. <laughs>